we have a great set of panelists here today. Uh, today we're going to talk about innovation, entrepreneurship, and investment in local food. Uh, as Robert mentioned, I'm here as a representative of the investment committee of the, of the uh, UCLA Venture Capital Fund. We actively seek out um, entrepreneurs to mentor, and we do make early seed stage investments in uh, entrepreneurial ventures. So if anybody has uh, ventures that they would like to be looked at, I'd be happy to look at them as well. Uh, I'm going to walk down the, uh, the, the group here. We'll start with Nicola Kerslaw. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? Um, hi, I'm Nicola. Um, I'm the founder of New Bean Capital, which is a registered investment advisor that um, has offices in Las Vegas and Reno. And we manage two early stage venture capital mandates, um, as part of which we've made 11 investments this year. And we'll probably finish out the year at about 14 or so. And three of those have been in the food and ag space. Uh, separate of those mandates, uh, we also have some significant interests in agriculture as a whole, um, including uh, the Indoor Agriculture Conference, which we encourage you to come to next March. Great. Uh, Rob Trice, would you tell us about yourself? Sure. So um, my name is Rob Trice. I'm up in Silicon Valley. I've been doing telecom, internet, and mobile venture capital investing for 14 years. And three things happened to me in the last 18 months or so. The first thing is my wife uh, left her job at Stanford to go run a cattle ranch in Pescadero, California called Tomcat Ranch. Uh, the second thing is uh, a buddy of mine asked me to go speak at a conference on innovation. I had a jet lag recovery day there. And so the conference organizers showed me around, showed me what they were doing in Auckland regarding food innovation, which blew me away. Came back from New Zealand, and two days later, my wife dragged me to a hackathon at Stanford D School uh, to look at the meat industry. We ended up winning this thing. I ended up on the cover of Modern Farmer magazine. And f it caused me to think a lot about the fact that if you think about Silicon Valley right now, the value that's being created is when all the, tech, all the technologies I've been investing in 14 years are being applied to, I'll call them sleepy verticals. So whether that's Uber for transportation or Airbnb for lodging or Square for payments. And I look at food and ag and it hasn't really been affected yet by the low cost disruption and exponential innovation um, that we're seeing in Silicon Valley. So what I did is I set up something called the Mixing Bowl Hub to connect IT, food and ag innovators simultaneously with that, I teamed up with a couple of friends of mine. We've started something called Better Food Ventures, where we're making angel investments on average about 20, 25K, aligned with the theme of applying, applying IT to the food and ag space. And uh, we just made our eighth investment this year. Great. Uh, Rob Tseng, would you tell us about yourself? Sure. Uh, my name's Robert C. I work for USDA Rural Development. And um, I have to call out the other Robert, because I wouldn't be sitting here if it weren't for the fact that I was at a he was, he was a co-panelist in, um, where were we, Fresno, the Fresno COG, sitting next to me, and we started talking, and um, he told me about this conference, and I thought it was really interesting to sign up to attend, not to speak at. Uh, <laughs> and then all of a sudden, I'm on the, the list to speak at. But um, I, I'm probably the most unique person you're ever gonna meet from USDA, because my focus is not running a program um, it's not, I'm not in the farm service agency, so I'm not, not um, out there on the farms. But my job actually um, is to take a systems approach to look at the rural, the rural regional sector and look for innovation and ways to drive the economy. And um, the panel we were on, actually I was talking about broadband, which has been mentioned here um, earlier this afternoon, um, is something that I um, actually identified as a key factor in driving economic growth, not just in rural areas, but also in urban areas. And it's linked to all this technology you've, talk, you've, you've heard, um, because a lot of that technology, uh, it depends on remote sensing devices, which transmits data through the air is a simple way to talk about it. And that means if you don't have wireless broadband on the farm, that technology doesn't work. So that's um, a lot of the stuff that I work on. Great, great. Thank you so much. So um, I, I have a couple of questions here for, for you all. Uh, since this is about technology and innovation, this first question will be about technology and innovation. So what current innovations or innovative business models really stand out for you all in the local food marketplace? We'll start with you, Rob. Uh, so uh, fundamentally, I'm looking at IT broadly defined as a way for local and sustainable to become bigger and for bigger to become more local and sustainable. And if I look specifically at that, we're seeing this democratization of technology um, from the farm to the fork. And 
the cost of starting an, uh, the average web startup has dropped about 100x in the last decade. So now that's creating this democratization, this exponential innovation where you have tons of innovation coming to the marketplace. The cost of innovation is coming down. And that should help local farmers succeed. So I'll give just one example of a company that um, I made an investment in earlier this year called eHarvest Hub. And eHarvest Hub addresses some of the key concerns that local farmers have. Uh, one is they give away a tracking and tracing capability for local farmers. Um, heretofore, I'd say that most of the solutions regarding tracking and tracing have been too expensive. The second thing they do is they aggregate supply. So if you're trying to outgrow the farmer's market, start looking at institutional buyers. They're going to want tracking and tracing. They're going to want good, consistent supply. And the third thing they're doing is, I hate to say this, but they're kind of creating an Uber, Uberization of the trucking uh, space for farmers in the sense that there's, they're cutting out the middleman so that farmers can work directly with truckers. So those are three key pain points that I see that address this, this topic of how you actually start to scale uh, local and sustainable. So it sounds like supply chain type activities. Yeah, I mean, I think that you can look from, you know, the whole Agduino's uh, movement, getting low cost telemetry on the farm. You can look at a lot of the kind of the guts on um, improving, you know, a lot of it, I would also say is just looking at um, getting local farmers, you know, to Colin's point earlier, getting to think more about being uh, a business person and using those tools that are available to every other business and less less like uh, a hobby or a, li a lifestyle choice, but more like a business. I mean, we know that the average failure rate of a new farmer is 75%. How can we get that down to 25%? Those are the kind of things that I'm looking at. Great. Nicola? Um, so I'd point out three really specific things. One is, um, as uh, Robert pointed out, a lot of farms just don't have the kind of broadband capacity that they would need to implement some of these technologies. So anything that is uh, GPS agnostic, um, and we're certainly seeing that um, on the UAV side. We're starting to see some technologies come through which actually are, um, can be used without GPS. Um, the second one is really anything on the indoor ag side, which is where I spend most of my uh, time uh, on indoor ag, anything that makes it cheaper to do smaller scale indoor ag, so to do urban scale indoor ag, anything that makes that um, cheaper, and that can be anything from cheaper sensors, cheaper way to get nutrients in. Um, there's a lot on the mechanization side. Every single indoor farmer I talk to nowadays is talking about mechanization. And yet I would say probably 50% of the business plans we see are doing you know, another uh, food distribution type model. Mm -hmm. We would love to see something that's actually about uh, changing the economics of those um, farms. And then the third issue that we see again and again is there just isn't data. You try as a non-farmer, as someone who didn't grow their first hydroponic crop at the age of eight, you try figuring out how much you're actually going to make. It's completely random walk. So one of the initiatives that um, MIT City Farm is leading is doing mesh networking of, um, of indoor farms across the country so that even non-farmers will have access to sufficient data that they can at least make a rational decision as to whether they want to participate in uh, some of these projects. Robert? Um, I'd, I'd say, um, as the, before you get into that, there's, there's three disruptive events going on in California that are, are going to drive the innovation. I mean, the first one is pretty obvious. Everyone's been talking about the drought and the issue of water. The, the second one that's out there is invasive species. We actually have, at any, any time, there's invasive species threat and pressure um, in California. I think yesterday when we were um, on the field trip, we were actually looking at a head of cabbage that had all these cabbage worms on it and had it half eaten the cabbage already, which is a graphic example of the daily threat that's faced. And, and so there's that issue that's out there and how that gets dealt with, which technology will help with that. The third issue, which I, actually no one has really talked about, is on the farm labor issue. Because if you boil it down, California, in a very simple terms, California agriculture, the business model assumes there's a large supply of low-cost, unskilled farm labor from Mexico. Yep. That's, a, that's in the process of coming to an end. I mean, I think if you talk to farmers now, they're already saying there is a labor shortage, um, in spite of the drought and people losing their jobs because of that. But what's happening in Mexico is that Mexico is undergoing a transformation that the United States had 100 years ago where they're shifting from a rural farm-based economy, and, they, and actually it's a NAFTA success if you want to look at it that way, that a large middle class has developed 
Um, the statistics are already out there. I saw this UC Davis analysis of the probability of um, rural residents in Mexico becoming farm workers. And the chart starts at 45% is the past. It's already down to 25%, and that chart is going straight down like that um, because of the opportunities. What that means here is if there's less farm labor, you're going to have to have technology that makes up for that, and it's there, the farm labor technology. So that's coming. You've heard some of the discussion of that here. I would say um, because of the drought, water saving um, devices, or it's actually more than a device, it's a device plus the agronomics to get efficiencies in agricultural production. That's gonna be true whether you're um, in the San Joaquin Valley or you're here in Los Angeles because water's gonna be at a premium and uh, much more so than it has been. And this is the way to manage that through that technology. Um, then the last piece, um, we talked about the drones. We had that, if we had a conversation about drones five years ago, which I did with Northrop Grumman, and they were asking us, can you think of a civilian use for drones? Because they couldn't think of it. Well, five years, three years ago, we probably could have had that same conversation, nothing there. Drones are the hottest thing. And to the point where I know that the uh, California State Fair is thinking about trying to bring drones to the next state fair to show the ag drones. Not, not the North Grumman drones, but the ag drones. <laughs> uh, we saw one yesterday, actually, and a good example of that. Um, but that will show, give you an example of how fast mm -hmm. technology moves, because this is something that almost literally didn't exist three years ago. Great, great. Can, can I yeah, jump in sure, on that? I, so just, just two thoughts. One, I really like your comment about labor. Um, it's something that I don't think we think enough about. Uh, and I think there's two themes I look at there. One is ameliorating the condition of existing workers, um, particularly as they are getting older. Um, and then the second thing is obviously the automation. Um, in that regard, and this gets to a comment that was made in, in the last panel, uh, we need to look overseas. So if you look at Europe, for instance, they've had to go through this labor shortage 10 years before us. And so if you look at a lot of the, 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 the technology that's coming over and automating, for instance, produce in Salinas, it's coming from places like Denmark. Um, Netherlands. And we're, what's that? The Netherlands. Is and the Netherlands, yeah. So uh, we're behind. So one of the things we're doing with the Mixing Bowl, we're trying to create an international marketplace for the diffusion of um, innovation in food and ag because a lot of the, the innovation that we do see right now comes out of a, maybe a you know, land-grade state university or it's an, a nation-state-based R&D lab. Uh, or it's you know locked safely um, behind the walls of a corporate R&D lab, but it's not getting out there. There's not an efficient marketplace for that diffusion of technology. Great. So there's been some talk about uh, capital requirements and funding sources here today. Uh, I'd like to ask you all your opinions about ways that local food entrepreneurs and growers can go about obtaining funding for their businesses. What kind of routes do you see? And I'm talking about not just small growers, but also IT, fund, uh, IT funded startups as well. Um, well, actually, what we're working on, one of the things we're looking at is bringing the VC community into um, the area of financing ag technology. That's the indirect way to get in, into farming because um, as has been discussed today, it's very clear that um, if you take the global perspective, by 2050, we're going to have to, one set of numbers would say double food production to meet demand. Um, California is the largest ag producing and exporting state and has 400 different crops. So it's got exactly the variety of products that are in global um, sales and competition. Um, and so that these VC companies, they look at this as, as somewhat of an assurance that if you know demand is going up and the increase in yield is not going up at a rate to meet that demand by 2050, it doesn't take much to figure out there is, is it going to be a 40-year constant upward pressure on prices. And if you can guarantee me that prices will go up for three decades, and it's going to fluctuate like that, but it's basically going to go up, I'm going to be interested in investing so in it. So you're saying the secular trends are there? Yes. And they're clear to everybody? Yeah, and it's, it's very clear. And, and, and there are people in the traditional VC community that have, have recognized that. Mm -hmm. They're looking to invest into ag, they're gonna do it through ag technology. Um, not all of them have, but they have, they're figuring this out. 
And, that, and that's something that's in play right now. How it's going to evolve, I can't tell you. It's just, it's something so new. Sure. Nicola? Um, actually, Rob, you go first. Uh, I would just say, I, your, your story around what you're doing with the, the yeah, I think investors. I think it's it, it's a bit more complex. If you look historically at ag investing, uh, it's it's gotten a bad rap, and I'm staying away from local right now. I'm just talking generally about ag and ag tech um, because we haven't had a healthy exit market. Things are now changing. You've seen Climate Corp bought by Monsanto. You've seen Land Lakes by companies like Geosys. So people are waking up to the opportunity. I do agree with your statement about you know, the secular trends. And the, the need, however, the life of – one thing to keep in mind about all of this is that the job of a venture capitalist, they're paid to make money on the money that they're given, so uh, in most cases, with one exception. So they've got to look at the life of their fund and, and look at opportunities are going to hopefully give them a, some sort of return within the time frame of that fund. So um, it's not good enough to say that within the next 50 years, just some long-term trends are going to pay off, right? I would say just generally, there's five kind of investors currently looking at food and ag, the food and ag space. Uh, the first are the traditional ag, ag and ag tech funders, um, and these guys may look at buying land. They may be looking at kind of look, you know, soy, corn, you know, big ag kind of deals. The second thing uh, that we're definitely seeing are social impact investors, and those are the guys that may be. Uh, more forgiving on the financials because they have, you know, more than a financial return that they're looking for. Um, they're seeing the need to change the food system. Uh, the third are the health and wellness guys who are now looking at that relationship between health and wellness and obviously food. Uh, let's see, who are the other, who's the other one I'm missing? Well, there's the financial VCs. And the interesting thing, oh, the clean tech guys. So to Robert's point, you've seen a lot of folks who are looking at maybe um, – irrigation systems and or water water retention uh, those guys are now kind of pivoting directly towards the ag space they've got a lot of know-how there and then the last one are the financial VCs and they are looking at importing what they know from other spaces and other technologies and applying that to food and ag as an example we've seen a ton of deals in the last mile food delivery space just in the last year, there have been 110 companies funded globally and over a half billion dollars just in companies like Instacart, Delivery Hero, and so forth. Uh, one of the financial VCs I talked to said that he's, he's looking at food. He's looking at consumer-facing food. I'm like, what is that? But fundamentally, it's that last mile of food. They're not really getting into the kind of the bowels of food or going upstream to production. And I would say as, a, as an entrepreneur, you really need to ask yourself two questions from the get-go. The first is, is my, is my model really a for-profit model or a non-profit model? Uh, we see a lot of business plans that really are non-profit business plans. They're, they're doing great social good. Um, unfortunately, when you're running an institutional mandate, you don't get to take that into account. And that's not because we're you know, hard-hearted about it. It's because we get put in prison if we do. So we kind of have an incentive not to. Um, we have to follow the mandate that we're given. So the first question you should ask yourself is, is this really a for-profit model? If it is a for-profit model, you should then sit down and do yourself a five-year basic spreadsheet. And if you cannot put your hand on your heart and say, I can probably give an investor 35 to 40% return, then do not waste your time going and chasing venture capital. There is nothing more heartbreaking than seeing a talented, Com committed entrepreneur waste six months chasing around after VCs when their model just doesn't fit. There are plenty of other places that you can get funding from that will not require that level of commitment and will not require that kind of return. So apologies for the cynicism. But no, that's no, that's great. That's great. So let's talk about that. That was actually my next question. For people who are not interested in VC or, or who are not, who don't have a business that is VC fundable, which is probably a large <coughs> group of people, what are the channels for raising capital, whether it's small capital for a, you know, for a farm or, or, or larger capital as well? Well, in, in some cases, USDA has been a traditional place for funding. For farms in particular, there, I mean, there's a whole agencies at USDA whose sole function is, is uh, basically farm financing, the, the farm service agency. That's traditionally what it has done, is provide the, the sort of financing from year to year for farms. If you look at uh, USDA Rural Development, there's uh, the Rural Business Enterprise Program. There's different programs for uh, entrepreneurs in the food space, not necessarily purely the, the farm space mm -hmm. um, that are there that can provide 
um, either in some cases grants, in some, and in many cases guaranteed loans, which will lower your financial cost. Um, I would throw out an additional uh, area which I think has potential, which hasn't been done yet, but AB 32, the carbon trading that's gone in. So we have carbon credit. Um, if you look at CARB, the California Air Resources Board, and you look at what their mission is, their mission is to protect the air quality of California. They've been given AB 32 with carbon trading as the means to do it, and there are literally, I think it's tens or hundreds of millions of, of dollars that will come in year by year um, uh, through that law. If you can make a connection, a linear connection, which I've done this argument um, to the CARB staff, between something that goes on in agriculture, and, and I'll use, um, I'll use the water irrigation efficiency devices as an example. If you can come in and you have these new um, soil sensors that can reduce the amount of water consumed by say as much as 40%, um, there'll be a range, and say everything else is equal. If you can reduce the amount of water by 40%, um, moving water in California accounts for about 17% of the electrical usage in the state. If you reduce the, dem the demand on electricity, or maybe more correctly, if you reduce the increase in demand on electricity, that electricity then is coming from these power plants that are carbon producing. Then you can see this connection if you encourage the farm sector to adopt these devices and reduce their energy demands, there's a savings on the electrical side. And that's enough of a link for CARB to yeah. consider financing those devices? Hmm. Interesting. So it almost seems like there could be an opportunity here for, for somebody to figure mm -hmm. out how to broker these CARB credits. Mm -hmm. Great. All right. Uh, I would just add, I mean, the other thing, obviously, the crowdfunding movement has been incredibly good for farmers. If you look at the like Kiva Zip, uh, I was talking with them recently. They're extremely pleased with the loans that have been given to farmers. The repayment rate is I think the highest of any vertical that they've actually had. Uh, if you look at something like Lending Club, you can get a loan of I think twenty, twenty-five thousand, um, and it doesn't have to be secured, um, and you can name your price. So you know, and obviously Kickstarter. So it, there's a lot of things. Even if that's you know new fencing and you need to take out a small amount of loans, that's that's something. I think the other thing is looking at um, taking the CSA model and doing more. Uh, Getting, if you have customers who are willing to do it, get them to sign a contract. Think about that as an asset that you can actually borrow against. If you can get a lender, um, you know, and again, that's kind of like it's a it's a stitching together the solution. It's not the big VC check, but then again, uh, that's probably where you are as a farmer. And then if you're not doing straight farming, accelerator programs often come with some form of check, whether that's in a uh, low interest type convertible note or whether it's just a straight investment. Um, the two kind of granddaddies are Y Combinator, who's done what now two ag deals, two decent sized ag deals out of their uh, program, and then Techstars, which is a much bigger uh, cohort, and they definitely have an interest in this sector. But beyond that, there are numerous regional ones which are doing some really interesting work. Um, there's one in uh, Washington uh, called Cultivate Ventures, which is focused on um, healthy food uh, branding. Um, and they're doing some really interesting work in, in launching new products. Um, and these programs typically last anywhere from six weeks to four months. And they come not only with a check, but with also a uh, network of mentors and then of, of peers that you can uh, swap stories with and use as, as a support network. So you're talking about accelerators? Yes. Are there specific accelerators or incubators that are designed to help uh, the food industry? Absolutely. Can you talk yeah. about those? There's a, there's a whole wave yeah, of them that so are coming many. out. Yeah. There's, there's more coming. Sure. Um, you know, particularly if you look at food and food products and ag, but even in the ag space, you know, I think I, think I know three that are going to be launching in the next couple months. Um, what, I, what I caution people, though, is just do a cost-benefit analysis. Because you really want to look at the track record of the people that are doing these. You want to make sure that they're dedicated. They're going to ask. Uh, it, it, and I would also look at their, you know, their domain expertise. And you need to step back and think about what are you actually trying to get out of an incubator and accelerator. On the other side, they're going to ask for their pound of flesh, and that might be eight percent of your company. Um, so you really need to do that cost-benefit analysis of okay, w you know, w 
what what am I actually looking to get out of this and is it worth the price? And then also when they offer you a term sheet, um, I'll bring in, I'm going to get shot for saying this, but when they offer you a term sheet, don't, uh, don't assume you have to accept it as is. Yep. Go find a lawyer locally who will give you an hour pro bono and figure out what works for you as well as for them. Great, great. Do you have any other comments, Robert? Oh. No? Okay. Great. Um, so let's talk about the development stages of agricultural ben uh, businesses. In traditional tech businesses and also in IT, you tend to see, uh, you know, concept, product, product market fit, you know, and then scaling. Do you see similar stages in the growing uh, businesses as well, or are there other types of development stages that you see? And in what stages are financing appropriate for each of those companies, each of those types of companies? Well, I can start it, and actually, maybe at the most primitive stage. Um, which is an opportunity to exploit is actually the technology that is developed in federal government labs. Mm -hmm. Because we're, we're actually working with uh, not only the Agricultural Research Service, which is part of USDA and what goes on in those labs, which is specifically research that's ag focused, but also the Department of Energy labs. So in California, you've got Lawrence Livermore and Lawrence Berkeley labs. And they're not ag focused, but these are some of the top scientists in the world and um, you go and talk to them. And basically, we've already paid for the research. Um, so it's a little different situation, but how you extract out of there something that's not defense related for us is you engage in the conversation. It's almost like something like this, but you engage in the conversation and you talk to the scientists and you tell them these are the challenges that agriculture faces. Is there anything in terms of the research that you've done or devices you've developed that could have an application or a solution to this problem. I think we're, we're likely in the long term to find some unique solutions precisely because they're not from agriculture. They have a totally different look sure. at it. So a new right? use for an old product. New eyes yeah. on, on the issue. And um, now the challenge for the investors or for the VCs is, oh, it's government. And no one knows which door to go through because it's not talking to the scientists is going to get you access to that mm -hmm. technology. So one of the things that we've deliberately done to move this is um, hold ag technology showcases where we pre-cleared the technologies presented so that they're authorized to sign a commercial license with anybody who... This is a USDA effort? This is, this is a USDA DOE effort. And um, so we, are, we had one last year, and I think... Um, this is a way of bringing us a, a source of innovation that we've already paid for. It's there for us to take advantage of. And those two labs, happen, the energy labs, happen to be in California. But we actually have access to all the Department of Energy labs. And they're perfectly willing to stage these events to bring this technology out, have it pre-cleared. So we've, we've short-circuited all the, the regulatory side of it. Do you have some examples of something that might be particularly relevant? Well, last year when we had it, um, one of the technologies um, the scientists had developed um, is essentially like a, a chip that goes on one of those soil sensors that can measure the amount of nitrates in the soil, because that's an environmental issue. Mm -hmm. And it can actually do the measurement in whatever the minimal, you know, the millions of whatever parts. But what was, I think, unique about it um, was that it could do the reading in less than two minutes. So it's fast, otherwise mm -hmm. normally you'd have to, it takes a while, you know, you do the soil test. So two minutes, it's on the device, you transmit the data, you got the information. What that potentially means is, because nitrates, it's fertilizer, um, when you are putting your fertilizer into your system, it's not in the farmer's interest to have any fertilizer go below the root level of the plant because it's wasted. If it goes below the root level of the plant, the other unintended consequence would be potentially, you know, some contamination of groundwater, depending upon how far down the nitrates get. This allows the farmer on each track where you have the sensors to know exactly when the saturation point is reached for the nitrates or fertilizer, stop mm -hmm. the process right, right there. So you, you're going to get a benefit in minimization of the cost of inputs, in this case fertilizer, and you're also going to get the environmental benefit of minimizing the environmental footprint of that. That's a device that um, 
Well, they're still open if you know someone who's interested in, in taking it to development, but that's, that's an example. Great. I was actually going to say, I can't discuss a specific technology, but one of, one of the companies that we've invested in is licensing USDA technology. They have a great working relationship, which surprised me with all due respect. I didn't expect that, but um, <laughs> they're having a lot of fun kind of yep. grokking on projects together. On the nitrogen issue, there's another company that, um, that we invested in called uh, Agronomic Technology Corp, or ADAPT-IN. It's a cloud-based nitrogen recommendation engine for farmers. So what I like about this model is it's based on 12 years of research done by a Cornell professor and then married up with two Silicon Valley experienced entrepreneurs. Mm -hmm. and, it's co and they basically have taken that, that research and, and, uh, and, brought, and, and productized it with this, these Silicon Valley entrepreneurs with uh, three years of um, ground truth data, the average farmer is uh, putting about 20% less nitrogen on the soil. So that's mm -hmm. an environmental impact, but then also it's a cost savings for the farmer. Yeah, and I, and I think that's an important thing to remember that a lot of this new technology, you are getting efficiencies in minimization of inputs, whether it's water or ag chemicals or application of pesticides. Um, it allows for, from a farmer's perspective on the bottom line aspect, it's reducing cost. Yeah. So there's a benefit there. There's a manipulation of that, that that can also increase yield beyond what you might expect. Then there's also the third, the environmental benefit of that, that comes along with it. And I think it opens the door uh, to be thinking about technology or the best case application of ag technology is where you also get an environmental benefit without a regulation that it comes with it. Um, and I think someone had talked earlier this morning about regulations and no, farmers don't like regulations. Nobody likes regulations. We have lots of regulations in California, but you could accomplish the same means of shrinking that environmental impact mm -hmm. through technology. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I want to, if you don't mind, I, I, I have a, there was a comment that I think it was Robert Eggers said, was talking earlier today about our agroculture. Um, and it's really interesting if you go to somewhere like the Netherlands. So the Netherlands is the size of the state of Maryland. And yet it's the second largest agricultural exporter in the world behind the United States. And I think part of, of what's happened there is they have a very good agroculture in the sense that 90% of their agriculture or agri-food producers are small and medium-sized businesses, and they don't have the same schism that we have here in the United States about the adoption of technology, the integration of technology into farming. You know, here we have this kind of big ag, and then we have a kind of a, a local food movement. That many people want to go back and farm like the Amish did 100 years ago. You don't see that in the Netherlands. They've had that discussion. They've got a broad base uh, where they want their, their societal their, their society to go and how they can bring agriculture and technology together to achieve that. We're not as mature here, which I think is just an interesting point that to, right. to bring up. So let's talk about the local food marketplace. I'd like to ask your opinions on the, on the most scalable and investment worthy business models that you see in the local food marketplace. Wait, wait. Start over there. <laughs> um, so for me, it's anything data based. I mean, still, the, you know, anything that is, you know, sensors that can capture environmental data that are so cheap that you don't mind if a cow stands on them. Mm -hmm. um, and we still haven't got there yet. I mean, most, we're, I'm on the board of a company that's uh, doing a, a microcontroller that's half the price and half the size of Arduino, and they're still not at that point. They've still probably got another 50% to go before folks would be happy to throw those away. But that, to my mind, is the most scalable because that's where we capture data. Data capture and yeah. ana analytics. Yeah, mm -hmm. I mean, there's no point. I mean, just by the laws of physics, you can't scale plants any faster than, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, unless, unless you're working on something. Yeah. 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 You may well have something. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I, I think it, that, that's a good point because it's, it's the data analytics, it's the connection that, um, that these phones offer in terms of the marketing side that really wasn't there before. So that if, if you've got... Um, Let's put it this way, if, if you have, and I, can, I think I could almost do this, if we had the apps in Sacramento, there's a uh, artisan pork producer in the Sacramento area, and he goes around there's a, to different farmer's markets, so he goes to a different one every day. And he has, and this is exactly what you want in your local act, he has probably the best tasting pork you ever had in your life. And 
Um, but I don't shop at that same farmer's market or I don't have time to get to that same one on a Saturday. But if I know where he is, I can stock him with this. And if I need to go, if I want to go shopping on Tuesday, I can figure out where he is. And he's in the uh, farmer's market in the Sacramento area. So you can track him, basically. I could track him. Well, they could do that as a marketing sure. thing. That hasn't been done yet. I would throw this out as, as basically it's a, it's a way to market where you've made a connection to the individual local farmer of their particular artisan product that you want. And then, because part of the challenge of a farmer's market is it's not open every day. And we shop. You know, we don't only shop on Saturday. That's, that's long gone. So if, you know, we have the need to go out, it opens the door to be able to actually track that artisan producer and actually be, you know, a customer that is, is more than a repeat customer that actually would probably help it show up on their bottom line, um, I think. And the other thing is the, the kind of non, the non-sexy stuff. So the fun stuff is the, um, the, the last mile solutions and these kind of incredibly glossy platforms that folks have come up with. Uh, we just looked at one uh, product that was for uh, food trucks. And so we went and talked to a bunch of, of food truck managers or whatever, however, your owners. And it turned out that their problem really wasn't what, what this company was trying to do. Their problem was that they had uh, become food truck owners because mostly they loved to cook and they were really good chefs. And what was driving them to nervous distraction was dealing with um, staffing, was dealing with the logistics of getting food in and out of the trucks and was uh, dealing with payments. Hmm. And that's really what they, and I, I'm yet to see anything that is a, you know, a WordPress for food truck owners. Oh. So some of it just isn't exciting stuff. It's, it's combining pieces that already exist in, in a way that is applicable to the particular you know, urban, urban ag folks. Great, great. I'll just answer. One of the things I think local food's got to do is think beyond the farmer's market. I personally think that the farmer's market is a death trap. When you look at a cost of gross sales analysis, um, it's a great way to go and start off and build your customer base. But then beyond that, look at the amount of time that you're spending at a farmer's market you know, and your, you know, the amount of time you have to invest to get whatever kind of revenue. How can you get beyond the farmer's market, and whether that's a good eggs or some sort of online marketplace, uh, or that's an institutional buyer, that's, for me at least, interesting because then you start to think about scale. And if you think about the enabling technologies that enable local, market, local producers to get to scale and compete head-to-head -head with the big boys, that's, that's what's exciting for me. And the, you know, I think what we're still seeing is that, that costing down of the technology, the democratization of that technology. I also would say that in particular on the ag space, I think you're going to see a lot more rapid adoption in Southern Hemisphere. And I'm expecting some technologies to boomerang back up into uh, the U.S. market. I think you might actually see, you know, for instance, drones. That's one technology where you've actually seen a faster adoption of those technologies in the Southern Hemisphere and other markets and now it's coming back into the US. So uh, th those are the kind of things that excite me. Let's, let's talk about drones for a second. I'd like to hear your opinions on, since we've been talking about them a little bit already, let's go ahead and dig into right. that and see, uh, and, and hear your opinions about what's going on with them and, and what the technology is capable of doing now mm -hmm. and, and what we can expect to see the next couple of years. Well, I, th I think the, the most immediate use of the drones is in this area of uh, data acquisition because it, it's going to be flying over areas with uh, different types of electronic cameras and capturing that information, which is then downloaded and you can use it to analyze what's going on in your particular field. I think what's coming will be drones because they can hover like, well, we saw it, three feet over, off the ground. A slightly bigger drone could, means you could have much more precise delivery of ag chemicals rather than a plane flying over. If I, if I, if I were um, you know, one of those companies that does the crop spraying, I'd be a little concerned about this in the intermediate future that um, I may be coming obsolete because think of how much cheaper it is to fly a drone around than hiring a licensed pilot and all the stuff with the, the plane. If I was you know, one of those companies, I'd buy some drones and go into that business. It's probably the logical thing to do. But it offers, because it, it fits into this pattern of, we didn't have a really big ag discussion about where ag is going to precision agriculture, but
but this is a piece, it's a tool that gets you to precision agriculture because it can not only capture the data and take the pictures, but it can actually, you know, deliver something and quite precisely, much more so than we have been before. Um, I would say that there is at least a new device that UC Davis Ag Engineering has developed, um, which it is a, I'm trying to think of, well, in layman's term, it's a camera that can determine whether or not the plant is thirsty, is a way to describe it. It's, it's looking at transpiration that I can read um, of the leaves, which basically determines whether the plant is thirsty. We talked a little bit earlier about soil moisture sensors. Well, a soil mo moisture sensor only does what it, 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 literally, the name of it is. It tells you how dry the soil is. It doesn't tell you whether the plant needs water. You're assuming if the plant, the soil is dry, the plant needs water. This thing that Davis has, has um, developed has actually made the soil sensor obsolete because your focus as a farmer is on the plant, the crop. So you have this device in the, in the plane, you fly overhead, you get your, you get your numbers back in real time, and you have to do your, then you're gonna, the agronomics comes in with the calculation. That's probably something, uh, a big uh, improvement in uh, farm management and yield that the drones could do. Do you think there's any application to urban farms to this type of automation? Well, I suppose it could pick up the head of lettuce and do the Amazon approach and fly over to your house and then drop it out. Um, I mean, I, I mean I, but let's just take that for a second. I mean, we're, we're talking about automatons, right, that, that are drones that have right. some type of technology and intelligence. Right. Do you see, and you had mentioned automation of, 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 mm -hmm. of greenhouses earlier, right? Do you see this moving into s smaller scale uh, farms that can be used in, in uh, I, I think it's clearly scalable to smaller farms because these drones don't cost a lot. Sure. So, I mean, think of the difference between hiring a crop duster uh, with a conventional plane, and you're not going to do that unless you have enough acreage to, to mm -hmm. make that worthwhile, the cost of that, whereas one of these drones, um, I'm trying to think, I want to say twenty to $50,000, depending upon the, the size of the drone, because one of the UC Davis researchers just went out and bought one on his own dime because he needed to test his mm -hmm. equipment. So uh, let me play contrarian here. I think the thing that we need to uh, identify is what is the business problem that we're trying to solve and what's the appropriate technology? If you go to FarmHack, uh, the open source community, there's a fantastic picture of a guy walking around with a helium balloon with a camera on the bottom. And he can walk around and do aerial imaging. And you can't tell the difference of whether that's from a satellite or from a drone or from a helium balloon. So, you know, that, that's aerial imaging being done at low sure. cost today, right? Uh -huh. So I don't think that there's a local farmer that can probably afford a $25,000 drone. Um, the amazing thing to me is, like your Northrop Grumman, Grumman guys, what I'm seeing is there's a lot of drone companies there are technologies in search of a marketplace. Uh -huh. And some of these drones, I, I talked to somebody who had a $125,000 drone and didn't have a camera on it, right? And to, to the earlier point about the, about the, the Cessnas, um, there's a company that, that I'm involved with that, uh, let me back up. If I look at this, and particularly on the aerial imaging, there's three steps to this. One is the vehicle or the vessel that actually is carrying some data capture technology, and there's a data analysis. And I look at all three of these differently. So the company that, that I'm involved with called Mavericks is agnostic on whatever that vehicle is. It can be a satellite, it can be a rocket ship, it can be a helium balloon. They have an imaging package that they put today on Cessnas and the Cessnas uh -huh. uh, can be used on large scale farms. The question is on the analytics side, right? And one thing to keep in mind on this is you first have to, you have to get a baseline. So a lot of these companies on this, the big data for ag you got to get a baseline, then you have to put something in there where you do a flyover, and then you have to look at what the performance improvement is. So you might be looking at two or three years from the time that you start to the time you can actually say, yeah, this is a cool technology. Uh -huh. Yeah. And we, we see a fair amount of uh, business plans around UAVs because we're in a test site area. Um, and the newer ones we're seeing are a lot cheaper. They're about 10,000 or so. Um, but still, they are, as uh, Rob said, they're a solution in search of a problem. I would say pretty much every single plan we've seen has not had a solid business model associated with it. 
Um, and in particular, almost all of them assume that the farmer is going to go out and spend $10,000, $15,000 on a piece of kit when we already know that most farmers are accustomed to buying these things as services. Mm -hmm. And um, until you can get to the point where you can offer this as a reliable service that actually fixes a real problem for the farmer as opposed to a marginal problem, then I just, I struggle with them. Yeah. Great. And, and just to remind everybody, today's regulations here in California, if you're a farmer, you have to own the drone and you have to operate it yourself. And uh -huh. what farmer actually wants wants to do that, right? Uh -huh. So everyone's thinking about, you know, drones as a service or aerial imaging as a service. That's not happening in a, in a large scale yet. Great. So again, on the, continuing on the theme of the local and regional food marketplaces, um, I'd like to know what your opinions are on the innovation that's going to be key to, uh, to growing that. What's going to be the game-changing innovations to growing uh, the local food marketplaces? Part of the challenge, if you talk about food hubs that we've seen, is that they don't actually pencil out by them as a standing, freestanding, almost all the proposals, they just don't pencil out because they're not big enough. Um, they, in order for them to work, they need some kind of, well, you could call it subsidy. Um, so you, you have to, so in some cases, the discussion is that if you want a food hub to really economically to work, they need to tie themselves in to say a food bank because a food bank actually is an aggregator and the food bank has food coming from one direction and the, the food hub actually would send it the other direction. So there may be some synergies there that with co-shared uh, refrigeration and things like that that reduce costs that may change the dial on it. There are some challenges. I, I talked about artisan pork. Well, on the slaughterhouse side, um, there's a lot of, there is some growth, I think, in um, artisan, I call it artisan beef, pork. They, you know, you're only talking one or two animals at a time. They're not going to go to one of these big slaughterhouses. They don't have, they're not set up for that. So, I mean, I actually talked to someone, I guess it was last week, who they're in um, Sonoma County, Mendocino County, and they have maybe two two animals a week. The local small-scale slaughterhouse has kind of been shut down for different reasons. They've <laughs> got to go to Reno. Hmm. You can figure out what that does to your costs, and that's not right. exactly um, carbon mile beneficial. Right. It sort right. of defeats the point of local. So there are challenges like that um, to work on, and I, I don't have a total answer um, to that. I think that's going to be a community decision to make, do you want to support, and if this is the key piece, having that local slaughterhouse and it doesn't pencil out, right. you've got to then make a, a community decision. Is that your local baseball stadium? <laughs> okay. We're going to be taking questions from the audience here in a few minutes. If you want to come down and um, find a microphone. I'll, I'll just say in the interim, so my wife actually got, her cattle ranch got caught up in that USDA shutdown of that slaughterhouse. Um, and it became apparent to all the local ranchers here, with all due respect, that USDA didn't understand how grass-fed beef processing worked, and that you actually could descale beef processing if it weren't for USDA regulation. So that slaughter plan had some um, <laughs> sanitary issues. <laughs> Separate. Yes. That's and why we're some other down. issues too. Yeah, they had some issues that weren't part of that. Yeah. Were, if, yeah. if you want some juicy. Gossipy, sexual. Hang out with people who talk about slaughterhouses <laughs> yeah. during dinner. Yeah, Look, just, just Google Rancho slaughterhouse sex and see what happens. You don't often associate beef slaughtering and sex, but I think we have a question from the audience <laughs> <laughs> related to that. I don't know if I want to follow. That. <laughs> Um, Seth Wilson with uh, Cutting Edge Capital. We help entrepreneurs raise capital through state regulated direct public offerings um, with access to non accredited investors with cost of capital ranging between 3% and 6%. Um, questions um, uh, for you. Um, from a, um, a, a VC perspective, um, in, in technology, we have what's called the Valley of Death. And um, a, a VC typically is very early in that valley of death process, and it sounds like 
a lot of the technologies that you're focused on could go either big ag or local um, um, or small ag, um, urban ag. And so kind of talk through, you mentioned, um, Rob, five different types of investors. Where do they jump in into that valley of death? How long do they think uh, they, they want to invest to get through? And what are their expectations along the ride? So every fund is different, and it depends on the size of your fund. So uh, you know, just, you know, just a level set, usually what happens is you go raise angel or seed financing, you do series A, B, C. What's happened recently in the VC market is you've had a bifurcation or you know, kind of a barbell approach where you have this bubble occurring on the seed and the angel side and you have this bubble occurring on the big massive funds. And what's happened is the middle is hollowed out. And so the hardest thing to get right now, they say in, in Silicon Valley is a series A financing. If you look at the average seed or angel financing round, the size of those rounds has doubled over the last couple of years. And what's happening is you're just getting, uh, I'm sorry to keep using these terms, but constipation um, <laughs> on this angel side because they just don't know where to go. So they're just getting bigger and bigger. And then you've got these big private equity guys who are swooping in because they're in search of returns. What that is doing, so, so if you're talking to a billion dollar company, a billion dollar fund, they're not going to be able to do a small $25,000 seed investment. So you've got to look at each each fund and then where they where they actually play. The best thing to do is go to something like Crunchbase and go look at the size of check that they've written, what kind of seed or, or stage that is. And the other thing that I would just say is not only are you seeing the funds hollow out in this middle, but we keep talking about this trend of going from seed to C. So as an example, I invested in a company that went from nine people to 500 people in 18 months. And... Um, that's, that company, I mean, the valuation just went from a tiny little, yeah, I hope you guys do okay, to blow it out, offices in Germany and China and all over the place. And so we, the, if you look at from a valuation, the size of the round, we skipped an A and a B. We went from a C to a C. And I think that's one of the things that y you see right now is that everybody's kind of, they talk about these unicorns, these billion dollar uh, valuation companies, and everyone's in search of the unicorns. And so it, it, the hardest thing to do, though, is get that Series A. Would you agree? Kind of. Kind I, mean, of. I think you know, the Series A has gone away because it's turned into something else. We see increasing numbers of folks just reopening their seed round. Yeah. And you're playing around with the term sheet a little bit. And so I think there are Series A's out there. They're just in different guys. Yeah. You know, the other thing that you mentioned is you see it as a choice between going with big ag or going with urban. Yeah. And I don't think we see it that way. I think you know, one of the reasons that this sector is interesting is that you're seeing um, a complete reinventing of the whole food supply chain, which are creating kind of new big ag. Um, so things like grass-fed beef you know, wasn't really a, a, a big industry even, even five or six years ago and is now you know, becoming mainstream. And I think that's one of the reasons that this, this period is so interesting um, within the sector. Right. And, and just one other question. With the, the focus on... The, the technology overlays uh, of agriculture, um, the, the traditional farmer or the urban farmer, or what we're looking at, um, how do you see, wh when you're looking for those returns on investments and the pressures that it puts on that entrepreneur in the tech space, what does that mean in terms of um, the impact on revenue potential for the, the base agricultural farmer and is there a way in urban ag to raise all boats, the farmer and the technologist that's bringing his technology um, to the project? And actually, most of the good deals that you see are ones that are doing things for the, char the farmer much more cheaply or much more efficiently than they can currently do for themselves. And so, you know, I'm sure you've seen, if you look at the inside of a, a tractor cab nowadays, it looks like, you know, a, it looks like a trading floor. Um, it's just a series of screens. Um, that, you know, that has evolved because each of those pieces of technology is making the farmer's day either easier or cheaper, by and large. Um, and so, I don't, again, I don't see it as an either-or. I don't see it as it taking away from the farmer. In fact, you know, one of the most exciting parts of this to me is that you are taking folks who would either be very average farmers and helping them to be good farmers, 
or you are taking folks who had never farmed once uh, you know, in their lives before and had always wanted to. I saw a great statistic recently that said that the largest cohort of new farmers now are not you know, young 18 and 20 somethings, they are uh, baby boomers who are saying, I'm done with corporate life, I've got enough of a nest egg, I'm gonna, I always wanted to farm like my granddad did and I'm gonna go try it. Um, and that to me is you know, one of the most exciting pieces. And again, those folks are not going to have the 25 year learning periods that, that farmers normally have. They're gonna have to get up to speed really, really quickly if they're gonna be able to compete. And that's really where one of the areas in which technology can, can help them out. Great, thank you. With the baby boomers farming, this isn't the question, but the old joke is, you know, how do you make a million dollars farming? You start with three million. So <laughs> that said, let's say I happen to know a teacher who works with inner city kids. In this case, it's Lincoln Heights. And uh, they're on a second floor walk up at a charter school um, above a Chinese restaurant and a, and a market. And um, they don't have the ability to farm, but they, they don't have a school lunch program. And they're locked in all day and they eat ramen and burritos. And let's just say that we did an Iron Chef contest and that conversation evolved to them making lunch for themselves. And how do we do that? Well, we wanted to do a school lunch truck. Uh, this teacher, not me, of course. And um, they, they know they have uh, guaranteed $2,000 a month in funding and revenue. And once they have that, they'll exhaust that for their lunch program. But they happen to have a farm to school lunch truck paid for by 1 o'clock. And they're 18 to 24. And they could do a lunch truck that's farm to school oriented. Where would a program like that get uh, business advice, uh, business consulting advice from, I don't know, maybe a graduate school at a business uh, college? Uh, maybe the school right here. <laughs> right here. We, I, can, I can have that conversation with you a afterwards. Um, there's a lot of resources for, for entrepreneurs to get mentorship uh, here at UCLA. Uh, not just at UCLA in general, but also here at the Anderson School. And I'd be happy to, uh, to have a conversation with you about that. I know the Price Center for Entre Entre Entrepreneurial Studies is here as well. They, they also help out. So um, That's a brilliant answer. I yeah. love that. Thank you. Okay. Check, check out Net Impact. Net Impact, they're here at UCLA. Yeah. Um, Mud, we talk about offline. Go ahead. So just a comment and a question. Uh, first, Robert, like, you're the first public official in years who you just acknowledge the fact that, you know, as bad as our water shortages, we actually have a labor shortage of farm labor. I mean, talk about a threat to food security. No one wants to pick our food. Um, and I'm not elected, that's why. <laughs> 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 it also poses a great opportunity to rethink our labor models. But um, uh, actually, Nicholas, you mentioned 30 to 40 percent return expected uh, for VC money. Like, what is the period for, um, generally, for that? Uh, three to four years, basically. Um, yeah, any longer than that, and it starts to, to not pencil out. And you know, I didn't set those numbers, by the way. I, uh, Industry standard. I got handed a mandate that I run. I don't get to, to pick the numbers. Right. In, in, in general, VC firms look for a three to four. They, they will usually, I think, the typical harvest period for a fund is seven years now, just because of the way things have been. One of the things that was mentioned earlier that I wanted to bring, bring up again is, is the idea of exits. And if you're trying to raise any kind of institutional money or professional investment, um, you need to think about how your investors are going to get out. And if you're a grower, you know, you need to think very clearly about what that means. And, and I don't know if we've, we've talked about this, but who are the strategic acquirers in this space? And you need to know who they are and why they would want to buy you. Maybe this is too complicated a question, but why does the EU accept a much longer return uh, than the U.S. does? So the, the long-term long view of uh, return. Well, why does the EU? Yeah, and then they, they seem to have a pretty vibrant economy, you know. I don't it, it does and it does. I mean, within the, um, I know the UK VC community better than the, the continental European one, but within the UK VC community, the return expectations are identical. They have a smaller pool of entrepreneurs to work with, and by and large, they have fewer uh, serial entrepreneurs. Serial entrepreneurs are important because they have, you know, they've done it before, and they know how to do it, so they can skip over a lot of the um, kind of obvious mistakes. Um, and you know, part of what's happened in the UK and in Europe as a whole is that those who are more entrepreneurial have basically figured out how to fly to Silicon Valley. And so there are some great 
um, you know, European entrepreneurs who are part of the, the US ecosystem, but I certainly haven't seen anything out of, uh, out of continental Europe that suggests that they're actually taking lower returns um, on their VC money at least. Okay. It may be true for other okay. parts, I don't know. Next question. Hi, this is Shravan Anderson, student and uh, data analyst with this day job. Uh, so my question is, uh, we, we talked about data analytics. So I was wondering, is there any publicly available information wherein, if at all, we want to hypothesize or test our models, if at all, uh, we want to uh, build anything like predictive analytics kind of stuff from, uh, you know, you know agri agri agriculture related data, let's say, for example, uh, so you're looking for like public public data? Yes, like human gen <laughs> genome project for uh, your uh, uh, next gen sequencing kind of stuff. Uh, is there any public publicly available data specific to agriculture? Uh, there, there there are some early initiatives. So so there's there's like the old soil samples. I think it's called SOGI that, that's out there, which will give you like a good good set of data about what kind of soil is out there and will potentially grow there. There are some initiatives underway trying to unify kind of big data for ag. So one is the OADA, Open Ag Data Alliance, another one is the Ag Data Consortia or something like that. But these are all pretty nascent efforts. So there's not really a lot out there. Thank Great. you. Great, one last question, come on up. Um, I'm interested in creating, I've been working on creating an aquaponic farm in the urban areas um, for the obvious reasons, creating local food, um, creating well-paying jobs and wealth, uh, all of that. And the last time I checked on the website of USDA, I saw that basically the grants were for rural areas, nothing for urban areas. Hmm. Has that changed? Because I even um, had a meeting with somebody and basically flat out told me that we don't have funds available for what you want to do. Well, your first challenge is there are 26 agencies at USDA, each have different programs and different requirements. Mm -hmm. For rural development, that would be true because rural development um, is defined where our limitation of where we can fund is based on uh, maximum population, which is either 10 to 20,000. So, it's clearly not Los Angeles. Um, <laughs> um, however, that being said. Uh, well, I didn't find any other program that would support urban agriculture. That's what Well, I'm there are not programs specifically supporting urban agriculture. What I suggest you do is, in, in many of these areas, and this, this also goes for like in the broadband area, there are, prog there are resources that you could have access to, but they don't have the specific subject matter name of what you're talking about, but they could apply into it. Um, because what you're talking about is a business enterprise. Mm -hmm. Now we have rural business enterprise programs and they are limited to 20,000, but we also have a value added farmer grant program, which if you are the farmer, and just hypothetically, let's define if you're, you know, if you're the farmer, um, you could potentially uh, the, the, the money is there for a farmer to create a value-added product from what they grow. The key to it is it has to be a farmer. It follows the food. It does not, it's not tied to population. So there's potentially in that program, you'd have to talk to the, lo the specialist on that to see technically whether it could be worked out from your description. Um, so there, you could go to SBA and talk to them. Or you, so it depends on what you're trying to do. Would the um, FSA's microloans work as well? We've seen, we've seen some folks use um, FSA. It's a new microloan program that I think they introduced last yeah. year mm -hmm. um, and has some really good interest rates on it from what we've seen. Yeah. I, you would have to check with the, the Farm Service Agency on, because I don't know whether they have a population uh, maximum requirement. Um, so you would have to, it's just another agency. So you'd have to go into their website and talk with them or call the FSA office in the area. They'll be able to tell you. And there's also the specialty crop block grant, which yes. they may get away with, right? Um, no, you will not. not. Okay. No. Uh, special crop block grants are not available to um, individual farmers or businesses. They're, they're only for broad purposes um, for uh, that benefit the marketing of specialty crops. I, 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 if they were doing educational and 
helping out lots of school children. <laughs> That's <laughs> what was suggested Sorry, last sorry. year here. Thank you for that. And I've sorry. looked at it, and I yeah. think you're right. Some of the I do not meet some of those requirements, yeah. but I, I will look into that again. I got another email, but I think that's why I'm saying I'm finding it difficult to get support from the uh, United I, I States Department I actually would go look at the Department of Commerce. Really? Uh -huh. Look over there. Mm -hmm. That's what I suggest, because I think there might be a closer fit for what you're interested in doing. Okay. Isn't, aren't they just uh, giving grants to nonprofits? No? Okay. Look carefully through the Department of Commerce. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Federal government okay. is huge. If you, you could, if you might be able to convince you, con, for me, for, you know, formulate yourself and get a Defense Department grant for all I know. So, <laughs> Remember, okay. the Defense Department financed the drones, so. Great, well thank you all so much for your time. This has been uh, a pleasure. Let's thank our panelists. <laughs>